I hope you guys have your umbrellas because this chapter just unleashed a rain of L's upon the One Piece community. I got some, I got some L's that I need to deliver here, please. Please help me deliver these L's. We got Bartolomeo there selling merchandise, straw hat merchandise to the townsfolk that he just invaded. Uh, not sure if that's a good idea, but regardless, you know, it's, it's still fun. Caesar's trying to get away. The commanders are on their ass. It's terrible. Throughout the chapter, I thought it was pretty enjoyable and, and kind of stupid that Capone just kept saying how bad the situation was. It's like, yeah, Sherlock, I know it's bad. I can see. And uh, So anyway, Pero Spero lifts up this candy wall and the brothers, Niji, Ichiji, and Yonji, combine their attacks to break or to destroy it and to just make a hole so that Caesar can pass through it. I like the name of it, it's Black Bug. Black obviously being a reference to the combination of a lot of colors. If you combine a lot of colors, you get black. So it makes sense because in this case, you're combining red, blue, and green. They break through the wall and people inside Capone are cheering. I think it's Nami who says, yeah, way to go Caesar, but you're still a scumbag. Let, let's just make that clear. In that same panel, when you see the, the people inside Capone cheering, and you look at the background, there's Panda Man there. Then Pero Spero, when he sees that they break through the wall, he's like, oh my, like just completely trolling. These big mom pirates know exactly what they're doing, right? They, they know. We go to Stussy and Dufel. The Tomate Baku box conveniently landed on the edge of a frosting cliff. And then Dufel falls over and Stussy's like, hmm, what, what do you want with this? And we get the reveal that she is part of ZP0. Part of ZP0. I don't know if this means that Rob is going to show up. Sooner or later, I hope so, I hope so, but it's like, wow, like the world government has their hands on everything. And now that I think about it, I always wondered how, like how convenient, right, that the admirals were capable of getting like these logia type devil fruits that are some of the most broken, broken fruits in the verse, right? They're very powerful fruits. It's almost as if the government says, if you become an admiral, we'll give you this rare fruit, okay? But I always thought, well, how, how are they even capable of securing these fruits? And to me, now it's kind of obvious that they have people who are working for the government in the underworld to secure these very rare treasures. They send out undercover agents like Stussy to secure these very valuable goods for them, okay? So she uses Shigan. She actually kills Dufeld, according to her. Okay, then again, this is One Piece, and <laughs> I'm not really sure if he's actually dead. But Morgan shows up. And he actually wants to see what's inside of the box. Thank goodness they did not open <laughs> the box there because both of them would have been dead. I wonder if Stussy has like the power to send out a distress call to the other CP agents, the ZP0 agents, to come pick her up. Because if that's the case, we may see Rob and Kaku show up to Whole Cake Islands or at least to the ruins of Whole Cake Island. Uh, you know, by the end. One thing that really became clear to me after reading this chapter is the fact that we are never coming back to Whole Cake Island again. The fight that was foreshadowed between Big Mom and Luffy, in my opinion, as I've been saying months and months in a row, will probably take place in Elbaf. And so to the people who just kept saying that Luffy was actually capable of taking down Big Mom, taking down his first Yonko in this arc, this is Oda's answer for you, and, I, and I'm so glad that that's the answer that we got, to the point where I even got tired of, of just giving you reasons for why she was not gonna fall. It's like a lot of these reasons didn't even matter to people. It didn't even matter that Big Mom had ties in Elbath, and we know that we're going to Elbath. And so in my opinion, it would make sense story-wise for her to have her fall in the same place where she kind of rose up, which is Elbath. It all ends where it began. It didn't matter that Katakuri was kind of barely introduced into the story and therefore it would just make no sense for him to be introduced and then get defeated this early. We haven't seen much of anything from Smoothie, so the same logic applies there. Also, we know almost absolutely nothing about the Three-Eyed Tribe, which which we know Big Mom knows something about because that's what's what caused the, the, the relationship with Pudding to be so important. It also didn't matter that Harjunding actually had a grudge against Big Mom, and therefore, in my opinion, Harjunding should witness the fall of Big Mom. I gave all these reasons, all right? It didn't even matter that Luffy said, when they were in prison in the book and actually calling her on the phone, Luffy said, I'm, I'm, I'll fight you some other time. This is a rescue mission. I'm only here to get Sanji. No, people still wanted Big Mom to fall. And it's like, holy crap. I mean, there's so much evidence against that fact. People still believed it. It also didn't matter that Luffy needed help defeating Cracker, okay, a sweet commander. He needed help defeating a sweet commander, and people wanted him to take down a Yonko in the same arc. How is that even possible? I don't know. And then, not only that, okay, but even last week, 
Some people still believe that Big Mom would follow this arc, even after you have Nami and Brooke saying, if we wanted to fight her, we would have brought the entire crew. They just got wrecked, man. They got absolutely wrecked. Even the shading by the end of the chapter changed. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but some of the characters were, were shaded in gray, just to show how desperate of a situation the guys were in. Big Mom, man, like she was baiting him hardcore. She's like, remember what you said back to me in Fishman Island? How you're gonna take me down? Now you're running, you coward. And then Luffy goes back and I'm like, wait a minute, careful Luffy, careful, all right? Falling, falling for this type of bait is exactly the same type of thing that got Ace killed. Regardless, I think we get one of the most epic exchanges we've gotten in this entire arc. Luffy goes, yeah, fourth. And he comes in there and he says, you know what, Big Mom, none of the stuff I said was a lie. I will take you down eventually, just not now, all right? After I take down Kaido, I'm coming for you because the guy who will become king of the pirates is me. And they clash. Big Mom uses armament hockey and I just want to really, really please pay attention because it's, it's intentionally made vague. I think Oda intentionally cuts away from the exchange, from the clash. We actually get a lot of bystanders there, a lot of people just like reacting to the clash and people flying away and you're just like, whoa, what, what's happening here? So I'm pretty sure that Big Mom did something during that clash that we don't get to see that actually managed to deactivate Luffy's gear force. She obviously forced him to deflate, but I don't know if in between those shots, those panels that we get, I, don't, I just get the feeling that Oda intentionally cut away from that because he wants to keep that something about Big Mama's secret for their actual fight that comes up after Wano, all right? And you even see like her armament hockey hand with the rings and there's like a, a source of energy. It could be her soul power or it could be another form of Prometheus. I'm actually leaning more towards it being the, the soul devil fruit ability. But then if that's the case, does that mean that she was capable of removing, of taking away some of Luffy's lifespan during the clash? And that's why Luffy's like, Ugh. like what, what happened there? What's interesting to me though, is the sound effect in that panel. If you see, if you read the sound effect, it's like bzz, bzz, bzz. What is that? And then look, all right, you know, you know a Yonko is hype. When you got another Yonko literally hyping them up. She's like, Kaido, you'll never ever defeat that thing and you're never getting out of here either. That was a beastly, beastly line. That thing, oh man. A Yonko will be a Yonko. A judge comes in there with a German speech, all right? She basically bites off his spear, just shatters the spear with her teeth, all right? And look, I'm not even kidding, all right? When I saw what happened next, when I saw how judge got KO'd, all right, by a bolt, a beam of lightning, I literally thought, and I cannot be the only one who thought this, I literally thought, is, is Oda like literally like out, out to troll King of Lightning with this panel? I just thought it was way too ironic for it just to be a coincidence. And I, I'm pretty sure that there was a recent interview where Oda says that he actually talks a lot to his editors and to his assistants because his assistants know about trends and stuff. So I'm just putting it out there. Shout out to King of Lightning. Go subscribe to him if you haven't. Anyway, Judge's helmet busts open, so we're gonna get to see his Sanji-like eyebrows pretty soon. I, I took my L2 in this chapter. It broke my heart. Did you see Ichiji got straight up demolished by Katakuri? Granted, I, I, there's a sense of pride in knowing that it was Katakuri who wrecked him, but he still got wrecked. Why, Sasuke? Why? At least, I will say this, at least he was able to open way for Caesar and Capone to escape Katakuri's clutches, right? But then Brulee comes in. By the way, I love that panel of Caesar being distracted and then Katakuri's just right there in front of his face, just like, where do you think you're going? <laughs> you were close, I'll give you that. You're just one step away, but I can see the future. And again, I just wanna highlight how emotionless Ichiji actually is. I think he's the most emotionless of the entire Vinsmokes because when Judge was in danger, all right, you see Yonji and Niji like turning around me like, oh, we gotta go, we gotta go protect dad. Ichiji didn't care. So I'm just gonna put this out there. I kind of want the Vince Mokes to escape, except for Sasuke, except for Ichiji, because I want Ichiji to join the Big Mom Pirates and eventually be a sweet commander. And then maybe eventually, 
down the road, he can fight Sanji. And I don't know if you know this, but initially, Oda wanted to name Sanji Naruto <laughs> because of the curly eyebrow, which resembles, you know, the spiral on a Naruto, the ingredient that you use on ramen. But when Naruto, the series came out, it was so popular that Oda said, I don't want my character to be known, uh, to have the same name as the main character of that series. So he changed it to Sanji. I also think this chapter pretty much confirms that Smoothie is literally and figuratively thirsty for girls because in, in one of those final pages, in, in that gray page that I talked about, you see her actually going for Reiju. So it's like, she went for Nami. She, she, she just loves squeezing these girls. And just when you think that the Alliance is about to perish at the hands of the Big Mom Pirates, I mean, Big Mom has Yonji and Niji just squeezing them like a Titan at this point. The Tamate Baku box explodes and everything is magical. The castle begins to collapse. That last page was literally a symphony, music to my ears, which is weird because it's visual. I'm not hearing anything, but I kind of feel like an orchestra kind of building up in my ears. I just want to say this just so people don't get it twisted. I'm a Luffy fan. Luffy's literally my favorite character in One Piece, and I'm really glad that he took this L because it would be unrealistic if he actually had won. I, I really do think that sometimes for the integrity of the story to make sense, you need the character to struggle. That's how we learn, that's how we grow. In fact, one of my favorite quotes from Luffy is in Enius Lobby when he's fighting Bruno. He says, I'm really glad that I was able to fight Aokiji, and I'm really glad that I lost to Aokiji because he taught me that I needed to get stronger. And that lesson actually pushed him to go beyond his limits and learn how to utilize Gear Second for the first time in his life. And I think this is just another time for that lesson to be repeated. That sometimes, despite the fact that you think that you've gotten stronger, you, you're still not strong enough and you need to keep training sometimes. And so I'm really glad that this is the direction that the story decided to go in because it just it's going to make for an amazing arc in Wano once Luffy unleashes his new form, whether it be Gear 5th or something else. It's just going to be even that much more rewarding when he goes up against Kaido. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping is that maybe the Vinsmokes, with all their technology, you know, the Germa and all their scientific advancements, maybe they have some type of chamber, some type of DB training style chamber or room that can help Luffy train in less time. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you did. This chapter was fantastic. I don't care what anybody says. I thought it was great. Comment down below with your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel for more One Piece reviews. Thank you guys. Bye.